Hello, everybody. It is Monday, July 24th. You're listening to the Mo News Podcast. I'm Mosh Wanunu. And I'm Jill Wagner. This is the place where we bring you just the facts. And we read all the news and read between the lines so you don't have to. Jill, it's good to see you virtually a few hours after I saw you in person this weekend. That's right. You and Alex stopped by my house um, where we have a great barter going. You guys bring fresh pie from, from, I think, a local pie stand somewhere. And we give you our old baby gear. Yeah, it's a, it's a great trade right now. Uh, <laughs> the pie stand, by the way, is called Briarmere Farms. If you're familiar with it on Long Island, it's out near the North Fork of Long Island. Uh, incredibly fresh fruit pies. Um, and I think uh, your husband has fallen in love with the raspberry yes. cream pie. Yes. <laughs> so we had a bunch of friends over. And I'll say that uh, by the end of the night, <laughs> we were all just basically eating the pie with spoons <laughs> straight from the <laughs> straight from the pan. Um, so Moshe, it, it got ugly. <laughs> but it was good. <laughs> well, Jill, we're very grateful for the baby gear. We now officially have a car seat. Thanks to uh, you and Mike. So grateful for that. Um, as we are in the uh, final countdown here, uh, just about nine weeks to go before our due date. And these last couple of months are going to go quickly, um, not to scare you. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's why I'm like, okay, there's a car seat to bring the baby home. Check. Uh, well, now we need like a place for the baby to sleep. Check. And a couple diapers. And I think those are the basics, And that's right? it. You're good. Okay. Um, all right, everybody. Let's get to some news. We are uh, also about one month from the first Republican primary debate, and some new polling shows that Donald Trump has a commanding lead over his rivals. We're going to break down the numbers, including a couple of candidates trailing, but showing some momentum. Meanwhile, even some Republicans taking aim at Ron DeSantis over Florida's controversial new black history curriculum overseas massive wildfires in Greece force thousands of people to evacuate. On to the economy, the Federal Reserve meets this week and is expected to raise interest rates yet again. Would you want to pay for groceries using your palm? Whole Foods is rolling out palm scanners, but will anyone use them? A help me sign leads to the rescue of a kidnapped Texas girl in Southern California will have the incredible details. And if you're planning to travel to Europe next summer, you're going to need a visa. Plus, we'll be breaking down the box office numbers from Barbenheimer. And Moshe is on this day in history. It's a mix of Nixon, Justin Timberlake, and Lance Armstrong, Jill. We've got range. All right, there is one month until the first Republican presidential primary debate and six months until voting begins. We have a gauge now for where the race stands in two key early voting states. So far, it does appear to be smooth sailing for former President Trump. Fox Business is out with polls for Iowa and South Carolina, the two states which vote first and third next winter. Right now, Trump crushing rivals in Iowa. He leads Ron DeSantis by 30 points. In that first caucus state, Trump commands 46 percent of the Republican vote, followed by the Florida governor at 16 percent. And then South Carolina Senator Tim Scott at 11 percent. The rest of the field is in single digits. The Iowa poll shows Scott, who usually attracts single digit levels of support, gaining a bit of momentum, although Trump, again, is still the commanding front runner. Notable in his first run in 2016, Trump came in second in the Iowa Republican caucus, trailing Texas Senator Ted Cruz by about three points. But he then commanded the majority of the key primaries as the rest of the field continued to split the vote and no one alternative emerged. Meanwhile, in South Carolina, Trump favored by 48 percent of GOP primary voters. He is 34 points ahead of the state's former governor, Nikki Haley, who is at 14 percent. Ron DeSantis polls at 13 percent there and then Scott getting 10 percent in his home state. Again, the rest of the field there in single digits. When asked about the second choices, the largest share of Trump backers say DeSantis is their second choice. For those favoring DeSantis, their second choices are Trump and Scott. Mike Pence has the unwelcome distinction of having the largest number of GOP voters, nearly four in 10 saying that they couldn't support him. Roughly two in 10 feel that way about Trump. 
Haley, DeSantis. Now, as far as the most important issues to early state voters, economic issues are number one, 41 percent. Then comes a tie for issue number two. Fifteen percent say immigration is their biggest issue. Another 15 percent say social issues like abortion and gender in school and sports are most important. So, Jill, just the latest poll here among uh, Republican primary voters that show that despite the legal issues, despite all of the baggage from the past uh, six plus years and his age and everything else, the Republican primary voters continue to want to see Donald Trump return to the White House. And that comes, as we should say, with two criminal indictments and two more set to potentially drop in the next couple of weeks, one related to January 6th on the federal front and one related to election interference in Georgia. So Trump remains in the driver's seat here. For the most part, this is a race for second place here. DeSantis continues to maintain that slot, though you do see, based on those polls, uh, a couple other candidates that are nipping at his heels here. Overall, you have 13 candidates total. That's something that the Trump people are very happy about. That means the field continues to split up here with a lot of people in single digits, and Trump being able to command Uh, you know, the primaries here with under 50% of the vote. The main battle right now continues to be between Trump and DeSantis. On Saturday, Trump dropped a few new ads, calling the Florida governor disloyal, uh, telling him to come home, Ron, amid the state's escalating housing and insurance crisis. Trump adding that the more people get to know Ron DeSantis, the lower his polls are going. Meanwhile, DeSantis is doing a bit of a reset here as they have spent big, promised big in the first couple of months, but haven't been able to really grow grow their numbers. So we told you on the pod last week that there were a bunch of cuts to his campaign. Uh, They're promising to be more of an insurgent run now. Uh, His advisors telling the New York Times to expect a leaner, meaner operation uh, days after uh, his fundraising numbers and his spending showed, you know, private planes, a huge fundraising operation, but that there were just a handful of large contributors here that were supporting him and he wasn't getting as much support as people expected from uh, smaller donors. So A reset happening on the DeSantis front, Uh, Trump continuing to dominate here. Uh, And the big question will be, who gets into second place here in a real dominating fashion? And how long will it be before the rest of the candidates will drop out sometime in the winter or early next year in the first few primaries, Jill? Because that's the issue they had in 2016, is a bunch of folks splitting up the vote and allowing Trump to win primary after primary after primary. You did see the Democrats in 2020 when Bernie Sanders looked like he might be able to take it. Immediately, you saw the Amy Klomachars and the Pete Buttigieg's of the world drop out in order to support Biden uh, as the alternative to Bernie Sanders. So the debate next month will be telling. That'll be taking place in Wisconsin. that will be hosted by Fox News. Uh, it'll be interesting to see who's critical of Trump here, because besides DeSantis, the rest of the candidates haven't been very critical of Trump, the front runner. That's typically what you need to do to pull the front runner down. Now, you do have the Chris Christie's of the world. Uh, Asa Hutchinson, the governor of Arkansas. But for the most part, some of the people you name there in the poll have not really been critical of Trump. They claim they can win without criticizing him. But if you look at history, uh, you can be skeptical of that strategy. Uh, Ultimately, you're going to be hearing a few states over and over again. That is Iowa, New Hampshire, South Carolina, and Florida. Those are the first four states that will vote. And typically, if you can run the table there or win most of them, you're on to a very strong start to win the nomination. All right, staying with politics, after an overhaul to Florida's African-American history standards, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis facing a barrage of criticism this week from politicians, educators, and historians who called the state's guidelines a sanitized version of history. One of the standards in the more than 200 pages of that new education plan says that middle schoolers should be instructed that black slaves, quote, developed skills which, in some instances, could be applied for their personal benefits. Florida's new standards land in the middle of a national tug of war on how race and gender should be taught in schools. There have been local skirmishes over banning books and what could be said about race in classrooms. Florida's Board of Education finalized the guidelines on Wednesday in a marathon meeting. It lasted more than seven hours. The standards follow Florida's education law that requires lessons on race be taught in an objective way that does not indoctrinate or persuade students to a particular point of view. The new standards focus on the brutality of slavery, but also emphasize the positive contributions of Black Americans throughout history, from Booker T. Washington to Zora Neale Hurston. 
Fifth graders are expected to learn about the resiliency of African Americans, including how the formerly enslaved helped others escape as part of the Underground Railroad and about the contributions of Black Americans during westward expansion. That is where defenders of the new Florida policy argue that the, quote, skills picked up during slavery are a part of the narrative. Now, at the same time, the new guidelines are coming under fire for trying to sugarcoat American history. When she learned of it, Vice President Kamala Harris directed her staffers to immediately plan a trip to Florida to respond. That is according to one White House official. Harris is the first black vice president. She gave a speech in Jacksonville, Florida, Friday, where she asked, quote, how is it that anyone could suggest that in the midst of these atrocities, that there was any benefit to being subjected to this level of dehumanization? DeSantis is even taking heat from his Republican rivals on the campaign trail. 2024 GOP candidate Will Hurd, a former congressman from Texas who is black, was quick to criticize, saying, quote, slavery wasn't a jobs program that taught beneficial skills. It was literally dehumanizing and subjugating people as property because they lacked any rights or freedoms. So the criticism did not only come from Heard on the Republican side. DeSantis over the weekend was asked about it. He appeared to try to deflect blame here when pressed on the controversy, saying, quote, I didn't do it. I wasn't involved in it. I think, though, I think they're probably going to show some of the folks that eventually learned how to be a blacksmith and part Parlayed that into later things in life. Uh, Chris Christie, who's also running for president, said, quote, DeSantis started this fire with the bill that he signed, and now he doesn't want to take responsibility for whatever is done in the aftermath of it. I didn't do it, and I'm not involved in it, are not the words of leadership, Christie said. Now, despite the fact that you have Vice President Harris saying that Florida is trying to replace history with lies, the education commissioner in Florida, Manny Diaz, argued last week that the changes to the black history curriculum are a spearhead for classrooms across the country. Uh, He said, I think this is something that's going to set the norm for the standards in other states. Our goal in Florida is to teach the good, the bad and the ugly of American history in an age appropriate manner. So, Jill, you mentioned the uh, positive spin here when it comes to the 250 years of brutal, oppressive slavery that slaves develop some skills, which they could be applied to their benefit at some point. Uh, Also at issue in this curriculum are uh, lessons that uh, effectively place partial blame on black people for violence during some of the race massacres over the past couple hundred years. For example, when students learn about several massacres and race riots against African-Americans in the early 1900s, they'll be taught, according to the new Florida standards, that, quote, acts of violence were perpetrated against and by African-Americans. So you have critics here, including the Florida Education Association, the statewide teachers union, calling the standards a big step backward. Uh, Other critics comparing it to saying engineers learned a lot from the 9-11 attacks when the buildings collapsed or that Jews learned perseverance or resilience from the Holocaust. On the other end here, you have a statement from Frances Presley Rice. She's one of the black members of the Florida Education Commission, the working group that developed these new guidelines. And she said that the language on skills was meant to show that those enslaved were not merely victims. Her quote, this is a statement that came out over the weekend amid all of the um, backlash that they had gotten. Frances Presley Rice writes, Florida students deserve to learn how slaves took advantage of whatever circumstances they were in to benefit themselves and the community of African descendants. Jill, we've reported on the controversies regarding education in Florida before. This has been a huge issue for Ron DeSantis, despite the fact that he doesn't want to quite deal with this specific issue. Uh, Back in January, the Florida Board of Education rejected a new course on African-American history and advanced placement AP course for high schoolers. Uh, That uh, became a whole subject of national uh, controversy. Notably, Florida is one of about a dozen states that does require the teaching of black history. Uh, That includes South Carolina, Tennessee, New York, and New Jersey. Uh, But here you have 200 plus pages of guidelines. Uh, Again, for the most part, teaching, you know, uh, slavery to be uh, a horrific practice At the same time, a couple of these guidelines here uh, becoming uh, real, really controversial really quickly with the vice president getting involved. Okay, time now for the speed read from the BBC. Some frightening images from Greece over the weekend. Nearly 20,000 people have been evacuated from the Greek island of Rhodes as wildfires burned for a sixth day on various parts of the island. Greek authorities said it was the largest evacuation from a wildfire in the country. Local police say about 16,000 people were evacuated by land. 
and 3,000 by sea from 12 villages and several hotels. Several people were briefly treated at a hospital for some issues. The British ambassador to Greece said the UK government is sending a rapid deployment team to support British nationals on roads. It is a popular locale for UK tourists. The Greek government said that personnel were on their way to Rhodes to set up a help desk at Rhodes International Airport for visitors who have lost their travel documents. So those of you unfamiliar with Rhodes, it's out there. I mean, there's like hundreds of Greek islands, but this is the one closer to Turkey. Uh, they're out far out there in the eastern part of the country. The weather remains hot across the board in Greece before midday. Temperatures had already reached 100 degrees. Winds were low, but are variable in Rhodes and a bunch of islands. Uh, and that's where there's concern about fires both on that island, other islands, and on the mainland. And so they have a lot of the country under watch right now at the highest level of risk for fire outbreaks. Temperatures in Athens and the capital reached 110 degrees on Sunday, 113 in interior parts of Greece. They are expecting a brief respite uh, midweek, but then another heat wave will start later in the week. Jill, fires are not uncommon on Greece, especially in the summer, but with the sustained heat above 110 that you've seen across the Mediterranean the past few summers, you've seen an outbreak of more fires and longer sustained fires than previous years. From Reuters, after a pause in June, the Federal Reserve is widely expected to implement another interest rate hike on Wednesday. Despite recent indications of slowing inflation following 10 consecutive hikes in just over a year, the Fed decided to halt its aggressive campaign of monetary tightening last month to allow policymakers more time to assess the U.S. economy's health and the impact of recent banking stresses on lending conditions. In the weeks since the pause, positive upgrades to economic growth and moderate inflation data have strengthened the likelihood that the Fed's rate-setting committee will vote for a quarter percentage point hike during their meetings on Tuesday and Wednesday. Although inflation has started to cool, it is still well above the Fed's 2% target. The June inflation rate was at 3%. This move would raise the federal funds rate to a range between 5.25% and 5.5%, its highest level since 2001. So Jill, that federal funds rate you just mentioned, the 5.25 to 5.5, is what a lot of other interest rates are based on. The former Fed chair, Ben Bernanke, you might remember his name. He also happens to be uh, a depression historian, uh, as well as uh, the person who served as Fed chair during the Great Recession back then in 08, 09. He says that he sees inflation falling more durably to the 3% range over the next six months as rent increases ebb, as auto prices decline, but that the Fed will want to see a better balance between demand and supply in the labor market before declaring victory in the fight against inflation. Uh, He told Bloomberg that it's still pretty hot and that while job vacancies have declined, there's still about 1.6 open positions for every person counted as unemployed. Uh, And with that, that means that the labor market is hot. That means that people are going to be able to demand more money, which means they have more money to spend, which then leads to inflation. And so we continue to live in this bizarro world where good news is bad news and bad news is good news. Uh, But the Bernanke comments uh, speak to the larger uh, perception now on Wall Street and among economists that the Fed's job is almost done. And they're hoping that this last increase here will be it, uh, that we will sit tight for a few months. And then the expectation is that interest rates, if the economy stabilizes and we don't drop into a, a major recession, and inflation actually lets up here to the 2% number they want to see, that we could in 2024 start to see interest rates drop again. All right, from the tech website, The Verge, Amazon will let shoppers pay with their palms at all Whole Foods stores by the end of the year. Amazon One is a biometric technology that lets users enter and pay for items at stores. By placing a palm over a scanning device, shoppers first have to connect their palm to a stored credit card. After that, they could pay by simply waving their hand over the kiosk. The company first introduced the technology in its Go cashierless stores, but later began adding it to Whole Foods supermarkets. Amazon One is now in more than 200 Whole Foods locations. The company said it will be available in all of their roughly 500 stores in the coming months. Amazon said Thursday it is seeing growing demand for the technology, with it recording 3 million uses of Amazon One. The bakery cafe chain Panera also began testing Amazon One at some of its stores earlier this year. 
And the Coors Field Baseball Stadium in Denver in May began letting attendees buy alcohol using the palm scanning device. Jill, that's just Jeff Bezos using it 3 million times at at a Whole Foods. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) Though, you know, Amazon claims that it is uh, seeing use here, though, Jill, uh, a number of Mo News Committee members reached out over the weekend when we posted the story on Instagram to say that at Whole Foods, I believe it was people who live in Santa Monica and Austin, Texas, that no one, they haven't witnessed anyone using the Palm technology. Uh, Although Amazon says that Palm scanning is considered more private than other forms of biometric identification, it has raised some concerns. One issue, Amazon will have to store your palm signature, your palm print, which Amazon uses the unique ridges and lines through your palm to create in their cloud. Now that is different than your Apple Face ID or your thumbprint, which many of us have used over the course of the past decade, which is actually locally uh, available on your device. That's why when you get a new iPhone, you have to uh, do the face ID again or do the thumbprint again. Whereas the Amazon thing lives out in the cloud. And so that has led some folks to say, oh, that feels a little um, more concerning to me uh, than uh, the Apple technology. Last year over at Red Rocks in Colorado, if you've ever seen a concert there, they stopped using the Amazon One technology after artists and others expressed concerns over data collection and surveillance. And it does come at a time that Amazon has received scrutiny over its handling of user data. They're facing a class action lawsuit right now, accusing Amazon Go of storing and tracking New York customers' body shapes, sizes, and palm prints without their knowledge. Uh, Jill, I mentioned that we posted this on Instagram over the weekend. I put up a poll uh, after uh, putting up the story saying, are you game? Are you into this? Uh, Pretty overwhelming numbers, about 14,000 Mo News Committee members voted. Again, not scientific, but on Instagram over the weekend, 91% said not interested, 9% said, sure, sign me up, palm me up, high five. (laughs) I actually responded um, to your question on Instagram saying that I'm not really sure what problem this solves for people because buying stuff, paying for groceries is pretty darn easy as it is, you could use Apple Pay if you really want. You can use credit cards, cash. I mean, I don't think that they're, it already feels pretty seamless to me. This is just one last thing, right? You don't need your phone or your card. In this case, Jill, you literally just need your hand and you carry that everywhere with you. Typically, most people do. Um, but, I, you know, I think that we're living in this world now where, uh, you know, we've given up a lot of privacy to these tech companies for convenience. The question is, how much more are willing to give up and how much more convenient do things need to get for people? Remember, Amazon has been testing the ability to just walk out of a store without interacting with any human beings uh, based on your that identity, I like. right? <laughs> there you go. So, so I guess this is the step before that. Uh, but Amazon appears to be testing out a bunch of these. Uh, and we'll see if, you know, even regionally or in certain cities, this gets adopted, you know, more widely uh, by people. But certainly, certainly, uh, but it certainly got a lot of people talking over the weekend. So in those Amazon Go stores, you just had to scan your your app on your phone and then you could pick up items and leave and you didn't have to talk to You just to walk anybody. out with a cart. You just Correct. Yeah, you just like go through the aisles, walk out with the cart, and it just knows what to charge you. Um, we're sort of all living on the cusp of these futuristic movies that came out in the 90s, right? Like the Minority Report, etc. This one feels like a bridge too far. I say that, and in like six months, I'm going to be the biggest proponent of this. I'm going, oh, you don't even need your phone. You can coming, just go anywhere. <laughs> coming from the same woman who still won't sign up for Zell. Jill, we need to get you on the Zell train. <laughs> All right, our next story comes to us from CBS News and a quick warning that some of the details in this story do involve the abuse of a minor. So if you're listening to this with kids in the car, uh, just you might want to skip forward uh, about a minute or two. A 13 year old girl who was kidnapped in Texas was rescued in Southern California when people who were passing by saw her hold up a help me sign in a parked car. This is according to police and federal authorities. This rescue occurred on July 9th in Long Beach, south of Los Angeles. These good Samaritans were in a parking lot when they saw the victim in a parked vehicle holding a sheet of paper with 
help me written on it. They immediately called 911. Steven Sablon, a 61 year old Texas man, was arrested and indicted on Thursday by a federal grand jury on charges of kidnapping and transportation of a minor with intent to engage in criminal sexual activity. The girl had left home without telling her parents because she was attempting to visit a school friend. She was walking down a street in San Antonio, Texas on July 6th when Sablon drove up, raised a black handgun and told her, if you don't get into the car with me, I'm going to hurt you. That is from an FBI affidavit supporting the criminal complaint. She was then sexually abused by Sablon for those three days before being rescued. So then she gets to Long Beach, California. Sablon parks at a laundromat, told the girl to change her clothes. When he goes inside to the laundromat to clean clothes, it gave the girl time to write help me on a piece of paper and display it in the window. The Samaritans saw it. The police were called. When the Long Beach police officers arrived, Sablon was back standing outside the car and they observed the girl mount the word help through the window. They then arrested him. He's been charged with one count of kidnapping one count of transportation of a minor, and will be arraigned on federal charges in L.A. According to court documents, Sablon was wanted for burglary out of Fort Worth, Texas, at the time of the kidnapping. But incredibly, this this story uh, does uh, reinforce to everyone, see something, say something, uh, and uh, quick thinking uh, by that girl uh, to be able to alert folks in the parking lot. From Morning Brew, new requirements are on the horizon for travelers with a U.S. passport looking to get to Europe. Until now, U.S. passports have given mostly unfettered access to 184 destinations worldwide. But the European Union announced it will continue the rollout of new travel document requirements through what's called the European Travel Information and Authorization System, So this will require travelers with U.S. passports to fill out an online visa application before being granted entry into the EU starting next January. The $8 online application process is pretty straightforward. Travelers just need to provide some basic biographical info, their travel plans and travel history, in addition to answering some security questions. Approval is typically emailed within an hour or up to 96 hours for those requiring further checks. Once approved, the authorization will be valid for multiple entries over a three-year period or until the traveler's passport expires. So this will now require all of us in the U.S. uh, starting in January, Jill, potentially, to have to like take a moment to be like, oh, I actually have to fill out an application to go to Europe. Not that most of us book last-second travel uh, the day before to Europe. This has been a long time in coming, though, and some travel experts say it could be delayed again, Jill. It's been pushed back a couple times now. This is all part of a European effort to clamp down on illegal immigration is also part of their counterterrorism efforts. Uh, By the way, for Americans who are curious about this, we run a similar visa waiver program and have done so since 2008 called the Electronic System for Travel Authorization, ESTA, and that actually requires citizens from Europe to apply online for a visa waiver, pay $21. uh, And this is all for stays under 90 days. So uh, if you're comparing here, our deal now, we got to pay $8 to go to Europe, but the Europeans, uh, that actually increased recently from $14. The Europeans now have to pay $21 for their application here. From the Associated Press, we're getting a sense of the incredible success of Barbie and Oppenheimer at the theaters on their opening weekend. Barbie claiming the top spot with a massive $155 million in ticket sales from North American theaters from 4,200 locations. It is the biggest opening of the year. Director Greta Gerwig also now owns the all-time record for most sales during the first weekend of release by a female director. Oppenheimer also soaring past expectations, taking in 80 million for more than 3,600 theaters in the U.S. and Canada. It marks director Christopher Nolan's biggest non-Batman debut and one of the best ever starts for an R-rated biographical drama. It is the first time that one movie opened to more than 100 million and another movie opened to more than 80 million in the same weekend. When all is settled, it will likely turn out to be the fourth biggest box office weekend of all time with over $300 million industry-wide. Jill, we were looking for tickets for either movie this weekend and we couldn't find them. We're actually looking for tickets for next weekend into next week, like 10, 12 days out in the New York area and can't find tickets for either film except for like a single seat in the front row and... Who likes that? You guys have to go like midweek, 11 a.m. or something. 
Right. We have to like the, the first showing of the day on a Wednesday or Thursday. Uh, we'll see if we can get it right now. The firm post track has been looking at the numbers uh, based on their data. Women drove the historic Barbie opening, making up 65% of the Barbie audiences and 40% of ticket buyers for Barbie were under the age of 25. Oppenheimer audiences, meanwhile, were 62% male and nearly two-thirds were over the age of 25. Jill, we were talking about Barbenheimer in the newsletter and on the pod on Friday. You know, effectively, two opposites here, but as many hoped, uh, both movies benefited in the end by this huge dual weekend. When you look at the international numbers, Barbie earned 182 million over 69 countries, fueling a $337 million global weekend. Oppenheimer, when you added international numbers, did just under $175 million. Uh, and notably, while Barbie dominated Oppenheimer in almost every country, in India, Oppenheimer was number one and Barbie was number two. It's pretty interesting. It sounds like uh, people enjoyed both films, at least from the reaction that I've been seeing online. Right. Two completely different films. You know, one is three hours plus history, you know, the development of the atomic bomb, right? And one is like, Barbie and Ken going to the real world. Uh, but for the most part, uh, have seen overwhelmingly positive things. Obviously, these days, you know, everything, you know, everyone likes a little piece of controversy. But for the most part, it appears they have done well. Uh, and this will continue to dominate. Notably, uh, the person who didn't do well over the weekend, Tom Cruise and his new Mission Impossible movie, they've had high hopes for that. Uh, and that had opened the previous weekend, slightly subpar. And now with the Barbie Oppenheimer domination effect, uh, not not very high hopes for the uh, mission, the latest Mission Impossible sequel. All right, let's close this out here, Jill, uh, with On This Day in History on this July 24th. We'll begin in 1974, 49 years ago today. The Supreme Court rules in the U.S. versus Nixon that President Nixon had to provide the transcripts of the Watergate tapes to the special prosecutor. The Supreme Court, in a key decision on executive privilege, rules that Nixon could not cite executive privilege as a reason for refusing to release tape recordings that had been subpoenaed as part of the Watergate case. Uh, just 16 days after this ruling, Jill, President Nixon would resign. All right, Jill, let's fast forward to the 1990s here. This week in history, 27 years ago, the U.S. women's gymnastics team, known as the Magnificent Seven, won gold. You might remember this, the injured Carrie Strug, executing a near-perfect vault landing despite a major leg injury. Jill, if you were watching the Atlanta Olympic Games and you remember that, you couldn't get away from that moment, Carrie Strug was probably the most popular person in America for a couple of weeks there. All right, from the famous to the infamous, on this date in 2005, American cyclist Lance Armstrong became the first rider to win the Tour de France seven times he would retire. But then just a few years later, in 2012, he was stripped of all of his titles after an investigation revealed that he was doping. Uh, he had denied it for a while, Joe, and then he admits in a major, I don't know if you remember this, this big Oprah interview, in 2013 that he had doped for his entire career uh, using performance enhancing drugs, uh, testosterone, HGH, a blood booster, cortisone, et cetera. Uh, and so again, you know, this is a case where you had Lance Armstrong at the top of his game and everyone looking up to him and then the doping comes out and it all, all falls apart. There's not that much news that is truly shocking and I feel like that was a story that for me was like, what? I, I remember yeah. being so incredibly shocked by that. Jill, I remember those Livestrong bracelets. Remember the yellow Livestrong bracelets that, that everyone would wear back uh, back in the aughts. Are we calling it the aughts these days? <laughs> yeah, I still do. The early 2000s. <laughs> <laughs> All right, on this July 24th, we have a couple happy birthday wishes for a few celebs, Jill. J-Lo turns 54 today. Elizabeth Moss, the actress, uh, turns 41. And Kramer. Michael Richards turned 74 today. J-Lo is just aging backwards. J-Lo at 54, but like, I mean, just amazing. The workout regimen, the skincare, or whatever she, she whatever her doctors are doing to her, um, pretty, pretty remarkable. I think it's getting Ben Affleck back in the gym now that he's back with her. <laughs> All right, we end here with a couple of pop culture items. On this day in 1998, 25 years ago today, uh, Saving Private Ryan, starring Tom Hanks, was released. It would go on to earn five Academy Awards, including a Best Director for Steven Spielberg. And Jill, in sync, On This Day in History, releases their fourth and final studio album, Celebrity, today, July 24th, 2001, Dirty Dirty Pop, and Girlfriend were among the hits on this album. 
Mosh, remember when Justin Timberlake was a singer? I feel like we haven't heard from him in so long. And even after he stopped making music, he really became an actor for a while. He was in some good movies, I thought. Jill, it has been a few years for JT. I mean, he really broke out there with his solo uh, solo hits there in the early 2000s. And then it looks like it's been a good six years since, uh, what, it, what, it, what was it called? Man of the Woods. I'm looking it up right here because even I was like, good question. Uh, when was the last time Timberlake uh, really headlined something? I guess he had the Super Bowl show in February of 2018 with uh, that album. So curious whether he'll uh, continue to grace us with new music. All right. We want to thank you for listening to the Mo News podcast. Follow us and subscribe so you don't miss an episode. Review us in the App Store so we can continue to grow. And appreciate all of you who have joined Mo News Premium over the weekend. We see a surge of people who came in. We did a deep dive on all things Sound of Freedom, the uh, film that came out, the religious thriller related to child trafficking that has uh, become a subject of controversy. Jill, so we did a deep dive over on the Mo News uh, Premium Instagram account. You can join that over at mo.news and get access to all of the exclusive content over there, as well as the members only podcast. Jill, we also will be doing deep dives on all the presidential candidates over on Mo News Premium in the coming weeks. Uh, so look out for that. Mo.news slash premium. All right. Bye, everybody. Later. <laughs>